I presented the second time I came to Guild meeting. The first meeting was such a nice meeting. And when I saw how they were supportive of the people who exhibited, I said, oh, I could do this. So it was a big leap of being, being very vulnerable with my craft, you know, and I was new at it. But I said, okay, I can present. And I presented and everybody was so, oh, Michelle, that was so nice. They put it on Facebook. I got a lot of likes. So, oh. so I was able to fly after that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the New York Guild of Handweavers Member Spotlight. My name is Katie Clements, and I'm the membership chair of the Guild. With almost 200 members, the New York Guild of Handweavers provides inspiration, information, and mutual support for anyone interested in weaving, tapestry, spinning, or fiber arts through speakers, workshops, as well as our lending library. Go to nyhandweavers.org for more information. Today, we will talk with New York Guild member Michelle Burke. Michelle is the tapestry weaver who has been part of the New York Guild since 2020. Her love of weaving began the moment she started a beginner's weaving course. Her weaving life really came alive during the COVID lockdown when she started to work from home. She finds weaving to be exciting, soothing, and grounding. She is motivated by both the stories she looks to tell in her work and the actual craft of weaving that expresses those stories. A frequent participant in the Guild's monthly show and tell, she finds inspiration within the Guild community, which helps keep her motivated to continue to give voice to her ideas in her expressive tapestries. Welcome, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you so much, Katie. I'm delighted to be here with you. <laughs> I've been wanting to talk to you about your weavings. Um, so uh, let's go with the first question, um, kind of a history. Did you have any fiber art experience before mm -hmm. weaving? No, no formal, just you know, I tried a little crochet, a little embroidery in the past, but not, not nothing significant. Mm -hmm. This is my really big attempt at um, in crafts that I've really honed with any, you know, type of competence so far. Yeah. Well, a brief uh, history of you. Uh, where did you grow up? And I grew up in you... J Jamaica and I've been in New York now for more than 25 years. So I consider myself a New Yorker. I originally came from Jamaica, but yes. Oh, well, yeah. After 10 years, I think you're officially, <laughs> we're, we get to the official New Yorker status. Then. Absolutely. And I feel like a New Yorker, so it's good. Well, uh, so tell me about your first weaving course. I did a course at the Brooklyn Braver, Brainery with Jesse Hyatt, another beautiful um, young weaver. And it just motivate me very rudimentary you know she made her own um, um loom you know with nails and um board from home depot and fine perfect it just got me excited and interested and i've been at course here and there but she really got me started and i bought my first loom i bought a proper loom after that course mm -hmm. and how uh how much time before the COVID lockdown was your weaving course? A year before. So I was doing little things, you know, little samples. Mm -hmm. So when it locked, I, have, I had started on that piece, Layers of Consciousness. And when I went home from COVID, I just finished it in no time. I somehow it just wove itself. If something amazing happened, I just went into it and psh, everything just came together. When I finished that piece, it was such of a big accomplishment and how quick life finished it and how quickly it wove itself that, you know, I felt like, oh, you know, this is, even though things are disoriented, there's some part of me that's still innate and natural. So it was very comfort. It was a comfort. Yeah. And being able to express yourself, you know, you're alone at home and you can still express yourself. So that, Yeah. We even really kept me together. I mean, other things, you know, I, like I said, I do Reiki and I, I started regular meditation practice, which I've kept you now through COVID. So all little things, eating, I eat better. I, I exercise more at home with, with um, YouTube, running videos and yoga. <laughs> so, you know, COVID was bad, but I kept it together. We even was part of it that kept it together. So, yeah, yeah. Good. I mean, it's been all good with me when it when it comes to to weaving. Yeah, I haven't had a down downside with my craft. I feel weaving is such an innate 
thing that when I do it, it's like I'm at home. I just, I've never been in a bad mood and don't weave. I don't know if it happens because I weave because I'm in a good mood or the weaving brings on the good mood. I, I really don't know where it starts or where it finishes, but it really keeps me really in a good, good place. I can sit for hours and I can weave and it's fine. So maybe something, maybe I was a weaver in a past life. I like to think so, because I, I like it so much. <laughs> so I came back to do more weaving. <laughs> yeah, right. Get, you have more things to get done. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so uh, who and what do you find inspiring? It, the weavers that I like at the moment, of course, I like what everybody likes. I love Sheila Hicks. I love Annie Albers. And my personal favorite is Joyce Scott. She's not so much of a weaver, but she does a lot of bead work and she does quilting and she does glass work. And she's just one of those very comprehensive artists that put so much, she's so talented. It's, it's, she's an amazing person, an amazing artist, and she does some weaving. But I just like her, I like her complexity. I like her humanity. And I, what I like about these artists, Annie and Sheila, is it you can touch their weaving. You know, there's such a tactile experience just by looking. You see the different textures, you see the glass, you see the beads, you see the, the fa fabric, you see the, the yarn. So that's part of my experience. It, in weaving the craft, I touch it. And when I see it, it's almost like a touch also, because I can see the different textures and the, the different you know, surfaces. So it's a really comprehensive experience for me. And the artists, their work reflects that complexity. Well, when you talk about Joy Scott, is her name? Is yes. Right? yes. Um, so it sounds like she is multifaceted in her yes. work. Do you do any other creative pursuits because you bring such a great uh, wealth of creativity to your work? I, I try a little jewelry making, but not as not not a lot. You know, I'm still I have heavy fingers sometimes. But the only thing I do creative, I don't know. I do I do a lot of reiki, which is not like a craft. But I do use my hands for reiki. But I do energy work. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, that's um, so interesting. Yeah. I uh, that makes a lot of sense. That there's a um, a depth with reiki, and a depth comes through your work and comes through my hands the reiki, the reiki is where you channel the energy through absolutely yeah oh that's great <laughs> um so let's start uh showing some of your weaving so tell me the title and uh of this work and more about this work yes this piece is a contemplation on a simplicity and it just means that the picture you look at it seems distorted, but somebody who knows what the picture really is can see it. And the mirrors there, so, so what you're looking at sometimes looks back at you. Because what you see is, is what you, you have seen before. So it's really a contemplation piece. And this was from my brother. He's, he's a wonderful brother, and I wanted to give him something that reflected a little bit on him. So this is a, this is a contemplation on a simplicity. So let's go, move in here and look at some of these details because uh, this, it's to see it at every angle is great. Mm -hmm. um, so can you read the um, the uh, words sure. across here? Okay. Contemplation on a simplicity when it is the abyss of complexity and intersectionality of past, future, and present. So we can only see what we have seen before. So looking at this looks like a, an animal, but it's really just the, the teeth in a human teeth. And only a person who has a lot of experience. My brother is a dentist, so he's, he knew exactly what this is. Another person uninformed might say, oh, that's an animal. That's some insect or something. No, actually, that's the human mouth. That's the mouth of a human being. So it is... looks complex. It's really simple if you know what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And have an overview of I was noticing like uh, the uh, 
detail here. Talk about this because it fascinates me. <laughs> I could look at this piece for so long. This is just another binary in and out, in and out, just simply using natural fiber, hemp fiber. It is really simple. It's complex because it looks complicated, but it's really because you're you're an artist yourself, so you see the complexity, but it, it's really just a simple weave. And just by varying the um the fab the fibers and mix them a little bit with some bigger in texture and some finer, it looks complicated, but it really is not. But you you see the nuances of it because you know you you are an artist. <laughs> The windows uh, here and here and how the fibers go back into itself just gives it such uh, interesting detail. But it's not because it, weaving is in and out, in and out, and this is just in and out, just you, because there are more multiple strands here, but it's the same technique. Very simple, very binary. Beautiful. Boy, Thank it you. is just great. Okay, so I think this um, it's a couple more details there. That's the yeah. piece from afar. Okay, and the next one. Yeah, tell me about this piece. This this was my my first COVID piece, mm -hmm. and it tells the Hindu story of a journey of the ocean. The title is the layers layers of consciousness. And these are all these waves, so to speak, are layers of consciousness. And as you go deeper, you find different things in your past, your childhood memories, just like the Hindu story. The snake turned the ocean of consciousness and brought up the nectar. They brought up poison. They brought up beauty. They brought up ugliness. So life, when you go deeper in your life, all different aspects of your life emerge from the ocean of consciousness, the layers of consciousness. So this was post, you know, this was COVID lockdown, fear and panic and all these, you know, isolation and everything was changing quickly. And this piece just really hit home for me. It's, it's captured where I was going through a lot of thoughts and scare and panic as we all went through at the onset of lockdown, mm -hmm. which was what should have been two weeks <laughs> And went into years. So um, yeah, this is one of this is my first piece, so to speak, and it continues to be my favorite. And this piece, as I said, it this this piece wove itself because I started with one thing in mind, and it just became the myth of the churning of the ocean. As I point the cursor to the different things, are there different? Uh, like, could you tell me what these represent? That's that's the sun mm. and that's the moon. That's the moon in the of, over that. Over is the moon. Mm -hmm. The little the moon. These are the moon. Um, the cycles of the moon. It's almost like a, you know the cycle. The cycle mm -hmm. when the moon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So those are like the four quarters of the moon. Oh yeah. The, yeah. And this is the moon. This 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 is the um the creation story of the of the eclipse. That the moon was watching when they were giving out the amarata, the, the nectar of the gods, and because they 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 spoke to the demon, and it was just a complicated story. And then the next one down is the snake that was churning the ocean, and then they, when they churned the ocean, the Lakshmi came up. She was the the beautiful lady came up. The poison came up. The jewels came up. All of these, you know, the deeper you go down, the more you find when you go deeper down. The jewels at the end, I um repurposed a necklace at the end. So those are the jewels, the conch, mm. what was found in, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lakshmi, the lady, the beautiful lady is Lakshmi. Ah. Yeah. yeah, so as you go further down, you find all these little things, the good, the bad. Yeah. That's it was hap that's what happens when you churn the ocean or you churn your consciousness. It's a story, but it's also complicated, you know. There are different levels to the story. Very simple. Mm -hmm. And then there's also much deeper stuff to it. Mm -hmm. so, nothing is simple. Nothing is complicated. The contradictions of the human experience. So do you read a lot? 
not as much as I would like to, mm -hmm. but I, I, I used to do a lot of um, Hindu mythology. I know a lot of stories, other creation stories and stories of the gods and the goddesses and the relationships. So um, I don't do them as much as I do now, but I've read a lot of the stories. We have to spend some time at your tapestry loom, so it's hard to <laughs> <laughs> hard to balance. Absolutely, absolutely. But you have all those great stories to influence your weaving. Yes, and you know, life stories also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Births and marriages and deaths and friends and family. All those are stories. New York is a big story. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you, do you, uh, has living in New York uh, influenced you as a weaver? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, textures and um, museums and people and cultures and food and experiences and strangers and travel. And, you know, you, you go if you go from borough to borough, from neighborhood to neighborhood within a borough, you have a different cultural experience. And, it, you know, I went to Guatemala once and you saw familiar things. You come to New York. This shirt I have is a Mexican shirt that I bought in my neighborhood. <laughs> so, you know, you, this, this is an Ethiopian silver. The lady told me this piece of jewelry that I bought. And I got this in New York. And I didn't have to travel to get this shirt because yeah. I got it in my neighborhood. You know, and it's, it's like a woven piece of fabric. So um, you're always stimulated by stepping out of your apartment and seeing people and talking with people and seeing beautiful things. And yeah. That's great. And the level of uh, uh, people's skill here is just, you know. Amazing. Yeah. And everybody has a story. And the immigrant story, you know, is in New York and there's so much of it. And the native New Yorkers, they all have stories. Every community has a story. Yeah. So definitely everything influences you when you're an artist. Yeah. So uh, we have a couple more pieces. So yeah, tell, tell us about this piece. This is the um, unicorn whale. It, it, he has one tooth, which is an extended tooth. So that's what you're looking at. That pointy thing is actually a tooth. And I said, this was, this was for my brother who is a dentist. So anything tooth teeth related, I think of him. And so because it's a unicorn male, that's the actual name given to the, to the whale. I put a little seahorse and I put a little koi fish in the Arctic Ocean just to give it a little flavor, a little fun. So I like this piece a lot. So I just, I sort of superimpose the, the whale on top of the ice so you could see the whale bed and see his tooth. Yeah. Yeah. One tooth, yeah. So I, that's why I put the koi fish. Okay, you'd never see koi fish in the Arctic Ocean or a seahorse. Right. I just made it a little fun piece. I remember this at the show and tell and yeah. just uh, how much people loved this, including me. <laughs> the, guild, the, the guild is very supportive of my work. I love, I love being around them. Um, talk about this piece. This is the Garden of Broken Dreams, which is another COVID piece. Everything in this garden is broken. The eye is broken. The, there's dead birds and, you know, broken eggs and trees that are falling apart. And lady comes out of shards of glass and an eye that's poked and the mandala is broken. Because, you know, it's just that life is broken sometimes and the world is broken with refugees and famine and COVID and so, you know, but even though it's, it's broken, it's still a beautiful piece. This was the first time I was actually weaving fabric. So the, 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 the flooring, the, the ground of the piece is fabric weave. Mm -hmm. and I really enjoy working with the fabric strips. And, um, you know, it's not a neutral piece, but it's still beautiful, even though everything is broken. So I still, I still like it a lot. Yeah. And I, you know, I, got all of these little pieces and put them all together this lady she's a queen but she's she's upside down on her crown oh which I thought was <laughs> yeah. she's a queen but she's upside down you know the monarch what you know the monarchy what can we say yeah and this guy you know his face is smashed and he he's, oh. he has a weave he has oh everything's broken up with him and but which it, one it, is this one 
the big the big head which is like a planter oh uh, the far sweet. left yes ah, okay the head that's broken and it's he's he actually has blood on his face because oh, he's broken I see. and he has you know he, he is bald in one part and has a a rug so to speak on the other part of his head mm-hmm. so not a pretty guy but you know sometimes that's how life is that's right <laughs> You are, we had touched on the guild. So uh, what does being a part of the guild mean to you? Oh, community. Beautiful, supportive, talented people. They're very generous as a community to a new weaver like myself because, you know, I'm still struggling getting my craft, getting my sides to, to be straight for the entire project and not curving. And they're just totally supportive. And, you know, they're super talented people. They just, they write books, they travel, they they teach, but they're just so supportive of new weavers. And, you know, they make mistakes. Show and tell, oh, you know, I did it this way. I had it restart. So you realize that the different iterations of a project happens whether you're gifted or you're talented or you've been weaving for 100 years. You still go through a learning phase and an adjustment phase. So that's what I like about the guild. It's, a, it's functionally supportive by giving me good, you know, and seeing how they hone their craft. But one thing I like about them, they're all hard workers and they're very consistent with their craft. You know, they're working on something. Some people present every month. They're always doing stuff. You, one of those, Katie, you do a tremendous amount of work that you do. And, you know, they travel, they, they weave and travel. They, everything they do is weaving. So I, I really like the community. It gives me a lot of support. Yeah, and it's not, you know, good good support. Mm-hmm. And when they do critiques of my work, you know, they, they're just so beautiful and gracious about it. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I presented the second time I came to Guild Meeting. The first meeting was such a nice meeting. And when I saw how they were supportive of the people who exhibited, I said, oh, I could do this. So it was a big leap of being being very vulnerable with my craft, you know, and I was new at it. But I said, okay, I can present. And I presented and everybody was so, oh, Michelle, that was so nice. They put it on Facebook. I got a lot of likes. So, oh. so I was able to fly after that. <laughs> you know, just thanks for the guild, for the opportunity for me to be so expressive and to stress the need for community, especially in, in these times of isolation. The group has really been a wonderful place to be. It's Great. The um, example of dedication people have Mm -hmm. and the feedback because weaving is a solitary endeavor. So to have others, you know, cheer you on is an important thing. Yep. Yeah. Especially people who are talented, you know, because everybody there is a master of their craft and they do other crafts as well. They do this, they do that, you know as well as having a wonderful life, you know, family, friends, whatever they do. So I, I think I landed in a really good place. I'm really happy with the community that they have been providing for me. And I, and I hope to be a part of that community in terms of, you know, whatever support or whatever. Because you have to, to be part of a community, you have to be, you also have to give and to receive. So I hope I can give something back, whatever, you know, whatever it is. I think you are today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so um, speaking of uh, seeing other weavings, um, what makes you respond wow to another weaver's work? Visually, what it does for me when I see it, I say, oh, that's beautiful. But when I hear of a craft person talking about their craft, what goes into it, how many times they had to do it over, what motivated them, you know, they dyed the fabric themselves or they dyed the yarn or they had to do this and this. And that motivates me because the level of competency, the level of skill, the level of hard work, that's also a big motivator. So not just the visual appeal, which of course, you know, you have to see it first and love it first, but the background information is also a great motivator. Because you realize hard work is part of everything. You're not going to just, it can't be just beautiful, just on merit, you know, just not by accident. You have to really put in the time. So that's, that's a great motivator for me. 
Uh, what would you say to someone just getting into weaving? Be vulnerable. Do whatever you love, you know, whatever fiber, fabric, yarn that you want to weave with. Just do it and find community. You know, find find community because they'll support you. They love it's community that loves people. People will support you in a genuine way. You don't have to like their craft or what they do, but just love the experience that they're having. And be vulnerable and work very hard at your craft. You can't get your craft by just, you know, you have to really work hard at it. Yeah, so be vulnerable and do, it, do whatever you want to do. Tell me more about the, uh, when you say be vulnerable. I'm curious about that. You try things and, you know, you do what, you know, everybody's maybe doing something else and you want to do something else. People might be wanting natural fibers. You want synthetic fibers. You know, that's what you want. So you do whatever makes you feel comfortable. And um, and as if you're in the right community, they won't discourage you. They'll, encourage, they'll understand that you have to do what you have to do. Because your craft starts wherever you start it at. You got to do what you never you need to do. You, oh. you may want to mix it with beads. You may want to mix, mix it with um, wood, photographs, whatever. You know, you got to find that little part that's really you. I mean, it's good to copy people, good examples too. But, you know, if you want to mix it up, it's good to do that. And you have to be vulnerable to do stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're yeah. saying about the vulnerability um, to willingness to put ourselves out there. Oh, well, authentic selves. Yeah. About weaving itself, what uh, what does weaving mean to you? It's a it's a state of mind, and it's also a craft. So you know you're weaving, and you're in a particular space in time. You're weaving, and you and it's also a touch. For me, it's also a touch. I'm touching the fabric, I'm touching the yarn, I'm touching the fiber. So I, I'm having that experience of touch and of seeing. And I'm also in a state of mind, because as I said, I can weave for hours. I can enjoy it for hours. And I can, I have to pull out sometime and it's fine. I just go back and I weave again. And I, you know, I sometimes I go over two and I didn't plan that. And I do it and it's it's it's, it's okay. I went to Guatemala on a textile, um, you know, a trip, and when I saw some of those weave, weaving projects, and the level of abstraction with these ladies and men, you know, and how they got the fabrics and the the colors and the, it was such a experience. I, I'm still not over it. I want to go to um maybe Peru next to see some of their, um, work, but. It's just, it's just mind boggling. The level of skill that they had, I mean, people do that type of stuff now with machine weaving, but you know, they did it all, just calculation and reduction and, and it was, wow, amazing. <laughs> and they did it from scratch. They dyed their own, you know, yarn and that was, a trip of that was a trip i went with vivian harvey she does trips to guatemala i hope to go back again but we you know one never knows what's gonna happen these days the travel experience yeah she, she's a she's another fantastic person that trip was was amazing and what's next what's ahead for you in your weaving well right now you know as my life is keeps changing I just change up now I'm selling insurance and so the piece that I'm working on two pieces the, the one behind me that you see in the um that's one a big piece this is my biggest piece to date that I've started working on and it's gonna tell a little bit about journey the journey of life the universal life you know crossroads and loves and obstacles and changes so that's one piece and then the other piece that I'm doing for my mother she passed in June I'm doing a little piece for her and our life, which is, you know, so that's a little bit deep. That's one's going to be all fabric. That's not going to be anything we woven. I might see if I can put a little weave in it because I love weave so much and it's such a personal piece, but trying to do bigger pieces. And then when I do bigger pieces, I work on, I work on proportions, how to get things 
to fit to size them in the piece because they will have some objects within the piece so i'm um, gonna see how that works in terms of a bigger size so you know continue to tell stories continue to um improve my craft but i still I'm still working with the tapestry loom i don't think i want to change looms or floor looms or anything it's so complicated i still want to stick with this format but maybe on a bigger scale but continue to tell stories and enjoy i'm still enjoying my craft a lot and being a member of the guild absolutely yes <laughs> yes so that's it for me. And, you know, a new job, as I said, I'm selling life insurance now. So that's another part of my life that I'm giving a lot of time to. Tra big transition then. Big, big transition. Yeah, a lot of transitions. Yes. Well, I am glad that uh, you're weaving through all of them. <laughs> oh, yes, I have to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely have to. Well, this has been great. Uh, I think so too. So thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Katie. And look a pleasure to seeing you uh, when we see each other. Absolutely. Same here. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please like, comment, and share, and subscribe to the New York Hilda Pan Weavers YouTube channel. If you're interested in joining the New York Hand Weavers Guild, please go to nyhandweavers.org. Thank you, and we'll see you at the next video. Happy weaving.